Hello and welcome back. And that's right, today I want to talk about a pretty bleeding, interesting Synology NAS. Today I want to talk about the new information I've received and updates on the Synology DS1823XS+. Now I know I normally rag on the names of these devices being incredibly horrible, but I actually sort of like the 1823XS+. It sounds quite nice, but... As the name would suggest, this is a new 8x desktop XS series NAS. It's the use, utilizing exactly the same chassis and design that we've seen in other 8x disk station devices from Synology. This is a new 10GBE Enterprise Grato XS Plus solution. And I'll be straight with you, there's a lot of things to talk about in today's video about this. Because although they've not exactly reinvented the wheel physically in a number of ways on this device, compared with the other eight bays that came before it, I will say that demand of a device like this in a number of key ways has been long overdue. So let's crack on straight away. So first and foremost, along the bottom of the screen, there's gonna be little chapter points there, no doubt, and I'm sure a number of you are gonna skip straight ahead to the bit where it says the CPU, and I'm sure that there is gonna be there. There's gonna be a whole section of this video dedicated just to that subject, but for the rest of you, let's go through the bits and bobs. So this is utilizing that eight base chassis, so you've got eight SATA bays there on the front. Those SATA bays can support 2.5 inch and three and a half inch media, as I'm sure you're aware. It's a metal chassis all the way around there, so you know, with the higher, larger enterprise drives, it's gonna make a bit more noise. Um, Again, you don't have to fully populate it. You can part populate, you can mix and match and put in some two and a half inch um, SSDs and three and a half inch hard drives there, but you can't mix the RAID up with an SHR. This device will not support Synology Hybrid RAID. It's an XS series device, so although you've got support with multiple storage pools and multiple volumes there on top, and you've got support of BTRFS, and of course, all of the features and services of DSM 7.1, 7.2, just around the corner, you don't have support of Synology Hybrid RAID. You've only got support of the traditional Synology RAID levels in there. You can, if you want, put some SSDs in. You've got that RAID F1 to play with if you choose. But overall, in terms of storage, you haven't got that flexibility of SHR, which I know a number of users, when it comes to the XS series, aren't hugely in favor of. But what I will say is this device does have a couple of M2 NVMe slots inside. Not a new thing with Synology. They've had that on their system for quite a while. But I will say in you know in the rather last six to eight months, we have seen Synology soften their position. I say soften, by the way, that's for important distinction. Their position on what M2 NVMe slots can do on their systems. And this device has two Gen 3 slots inside there. And of course, until we have it here in the studio, we're not going to be able to do any kind of deep uh, putty level breakdown of the hardware architecture of this thing. But I will say that I think it's pretty likely this system's going to allow M2 NVMe's as storage balls. I do not have that confirmed. They definitely will support read-write cache, of course, but I'm pretty sure they're going to allow this to have storage pools on there. And if they do, that means this 8 base system is going to be great for a three-tier storage system. You're going to have the M2 NVMEs, which you can use as a nice, fast, hot data for your photo, video edit in there as a scratch disk or a good old database. Then you can use the main 8 base there, either fully populating with a big old hard drive and create an archive, or you can go ahead and separate them down the middle, maybe put four to six traditional wild style hard drive for your cold storage, and then put some of those SATA SSDs inside there for your warm storage there in the middle. So this 8 base got a lot of potential in terms of its storage capabilities. Talking of storage capabilities, it's also expandable. The 18 in the model ID, as you would assume, it means you can attach two of those DX517 JBOD expansion devices there. They're not the cheapest, they knock around for about 350 to 450 nicker, depending on where you are in the world but at least it is pretty expandable and there's a lot you can do within that storage makeup and hopefully those storage pools on M2 and VMEs will be enabled. Now talking of pricing, I would normally start the video with the price out of a device or end it on the price, but the reason I'm gonna mention it now is we just simply do not have a confirmed price at the time of recording there. Now, the price I've seen online, it has appeared on some eShops and that would suggest that this device is gonna arrive relatively soon and by that what I mean is probably towards right at the end of Feb in some regions but definitely within March I reckon in a lot of places it's just listed in too many eShops either by error or you know just ripping from a feed where it shouldn't have been there 
that show that it's around there. But the price doesn't really have a fixed price. The only price I could really find is listings, uh, again, time of recording, in Europe for around 1,600 euros. So again, currency conversions, you've got to factor in your tax and shipping and stuff like that. You're looking at somewhere in the region of about 15 to maybe 1,750 of your local currency. But again, we're still looking for classification on tax, shipping, that sort of stuff, and regional currency differences there. Now, Another thing about this device worth talking about is the ports and connections. And obviously, there's going to be one that stands out more than the others. Those of you that followed this channel and indeed now as compared to the blog, around about July, September of, uh, July, August, September of last year, you'll know that we alluded to this device existing back then. We heard rumors and little bibs and bobs of information online. We didn't have a lot about it, but we knew this was a new XS Series 10 GBE. 8 bay and now we've got the information finally some half a year later i can confirm it this device arrives with that familiar chassis that we know but it also arrives with one 10 gbe port that's a 10 g base t copper connection there it's also got two 1 gbe ports there it's also got an out of bounds or out of band port there then um oob port there for making your way around uh, existing network there again we talked about that in other videos it's got three usb uh usb 3.2 gen 1 ports so again plenty of usb but they are five gigabits per second usb now that might just be a limitation of the CPU and chipset. And again, we'll talk about that more later on. So I'm not going to rag them too much, but frankly, Synology's not exactly been, you know, incredibly forward about upgrading those USB ports in terms of capability and hardware on there. What I will add though, is this system also has a PCIe upgrade slot. So not only have you got at 1000 megs local connection there, and you've got a couple of one GBEs for, you know, your internet coming in and out or whatever, and you've got the M2 NVMe slots inside, but you've also got an upgrade slot. Now, that upgrade slot can be utilized for chucking on more 10 GBEs. It can be utilized for their, uh, they've got a 25 gig fiber channel card there. You've got other upgrade cards too. Although, again, if you're going to utilize that slot for M2s, I don't know if you're going to be able to use M2s as storage pools within that slot. Pretty unlikely. It's probably going to be card bound. We don't know enough at this time. Now, there's going to be two different kinds of user when you hear that information. There's going to be the one kind of user that goes, why is there only one 10 GBE port? For the love of God, stick two on there. It's an 8-bay, I want to make the most of it. And there'll be another bunch of people that go, well, this is an 8-bay saturation at 8 bays of storage. Maybe if you're using SATA SSDs but with additional hard drives, yes, you'll saturate one 10 GBE connection, easy as. But 8 bays of storage, you might struggle, depending on your workload and your file rate, to saturate 20 gig of uh, 20 gigabit of connection there and again yes and no that is true but given that there's m2 nvme slots inside that potentially could be storage pool utilized um, and you've got the ability to put onto expansion devices in there i think a couple of 10 gbes would be useful it would make sense but i can understand why they might change the pricing and the value in there and still give you the option to upgrade via that pcie slot so in many regards and I would say in most regards, in fact, this is the ideal 10 bay that a lot of people have been, uh, 8 bay that people have been waiting for from Synology because it's got the M2s there, it's got 10 GBE on board, it's got an XS series, you've got your five years of warranty there. What's not to love? Well, from this point, we've got to start talking about that CPU. And as I say, we've got a lot to get our teeth into. So that's why I'm going to put a quick transition here to break it into a whole separate section. So why have I needed to make a big song and dance about separating, talking about the CPU on this device, more than any other thing about it? Well, because the CPU in this is a, not so much going to divide opinion like we saw with AMD uh, Ryzen series being utilized instead of Intel's in the likes of the 723 and the 93, but there is certainly going to be a body of users who are Intel supporters who are going to see this and think for a moment. Though I would say this isn't a terrible CPU choice overall. It is another embedded AMD Ryzen. It is, let's get the number right there, the V1708B. Now this is a quad-core um, eight-thread processor. It arrives with a clock speed of 3.35 gigahertz. I have seen on some databases online that it can be burst up to 3.6, but I'm not 100% I'm not certain of that. So for now, I'm just going to base it on that clock speed of 3.35. And this quad-core CPU there is 
in place, I would argue, of a Xeon. Now, the reason I say that is although this 8-bay device is new, there hasn't you know, been a 10GBE equipped 8-bay desktop since the 50, oh, sorry, the 1817 from some 2006-17 released. So technically, this is sort of a new box to the product family, but at the same time, it's sort of going to live between the 1821 Plus, which had an AMD in, uh, embedded rise on the V1500B, and the DS1621XS. That was a 6x 10GBE system. It had the M2s, it had the PCIe2s. It's basically very similar to the one we're talking about today. However, that device was a 6x, this is an 8x there. So there's a good chance this is a follow-up to that. They've just gone with the extra base, but we're just not 100% certain, so we've got to hedge our bets. But the reason I bring that up is this CPU needs to be gauged in three very specific ways. One, is it a good CPU in of itself? Two, how does it compare to the CPU inside the DS21 Plus? And how does it compare against the CPU in the DS1621XS Plus? And I would say, in most regards, it does exceedingly well. Of course, it's not an integrated graphics processor. I never thought Synology would put an integrated graphics processor in here. I would have loved it if they put an Intel Core. I'd have loved it if they put one of the Vega graphics enabled embedded Ryzen's in the V1000 family. I'd have loved it if they put in a Xeon W or something with integrated graphics on board. But they were never going to do that. Synology made it abundantly clear that that's not their jam. So when I say that this CPU does very well when compared to those two other devices, I really do mean it. Because although this is a more expensive box, there's the argument that if you compare it against the other uh, Ryzen uh, based CPU in the 1821 plus that V1500B, this has the uh, same number of cores and threads, but a substantially higher clock speed there, and just overall a better efficiency rate in there overall. Now, if we compare it against the Xeon, the 1527, the, D, uh, the D1527 and the 1621XS, I'm super cool and great at parties, by the way. If you compare it against that Xeon, it still stacks up very well with a higher clock speed and just generally better options overall. The only thing that the Xeon had really in its back pocket, apart from TDP that we'll talk about in a moment, is that it supported more memory. But because Synology limits these devices to only support up to a maximum 32, because there's only two sodium slots and Synology, at least at the time of recording, seems to have only 16 gig in-house memory, that advantage for the Intel Xeon, which is an older chip as well, isn't really seen here. So this CPU, that 1780B, I would argue is a very, very good chip for what we're seeing here. It's gonna have great throughput there. It's gonna have great performance and high handling of file management pushing all the way through. Obviously, integrated graphics wise is not gonna be great, but at the same time, this system moves out of that bracket for a lot of people here. I don't think a lot of users are gonna look at this system for things like Plex and Multimedia. Yes, there will be some that do, because they look at things like the 923, they look at the scale of some systems and it's a good little middle ground, although at that price tag, whoo. But I mentioned it and alluded to it there, that TDP. Now that's effectively that power rate in there. And again, it can, you know, obviously that's not what TDP stands for, but this CPU is much more power hungry, literally power hungry, um, than the likes of the V1500B and the Xeon that I alluded to there. It has a TDP rating of between uh, 35 and uh, 54 watts. A lot of websites list it bang in the middle there at 45, but that's quite a high TDP for a 24 seven system. And I know a lot of people kind of had that similar beef when they saw the CPU, the R1600 that arrived for a lot of the Plus series recently. Now, Synology has really been making that move towards AMD more and more. They've changed out some of their um, SA SAS um, kind of hyperscale devices over to EPYC AMD processors. We're seeing more uh, embedded Ryzons, not only here, but in the previous releases. I hate Seagulls. But to their defense, only a little, I would say that uh, AMD has a longer commitment to a lot of their processors. I will sort that Seagull out, I swear. Um, but that processor inside there its run is till 2028. The commitment towards that CPU and updates and everything in between is going to be long running, not only the manufacturing running as well. This CPU is going to appear in a lot more system from Synology. Dare I say, this isn't even the first Synology to have this um, 1780 processor. It, the first one was that um, a cost-effective flash station rack mount, the FS2500. So... It, you can see why they've gone for this processor. Indeed, when it comes to memory, I swear. Indeed, when it comes to memory, 
This system arrives with 8 gig by default, much like the DS1621XS that can be upgraded to 32 gig, and that is ECC memory. So you've got a system with a CPU that can really push that data through. You've got 10 GB connection along with the M2s, which will hopefully be storage pools, and a PCIe upgrade slot there to increase a number of different things along the line. And all the time, you've got ECC memory, double checking everything as it passing through, and you've got BTRFS running inside to run internal file self-healing and checks with integrity checks on file going through it. What I'm saying is, as an 8-bay system, this is by far one of the best 8-bays this brand has ever put out. And unlike our conversations previously, when we have looked at uh, the 4-bay and that 2-bay, when they arrive in an AMD Ryzen instead of an Intel, and a lot of us were like, the target demographic for that box doesn't want that. So either Synology have changed where that device lives in its portfolio, and maybe we'll see, I don't know, a 423 or a 223 plus in the near future, or Synology have ignored those people. In the case of this 8-bay, that is not the case, because this device and its target demographic are going to be able to utilize a lot of these things straight away. It's just that lack of SHR, there's a bit of a pain in the bum, and the fact that this device it's, one, it's going to be quite noisy for a start there, but also that CPU is going to be quite power hungry. And before we end this video, I will touch on, I kind of alluded it to it, alluded to it there, hard drives, SSDs, and compatibility. Because another thing we've talked about a lot in the last year, 18 months, is Synology's position on hard drives. And with this device, we still have no confirmation on hard drive compatibility here, but I think it would be fair to say there's a reasonable possibility that the supported compatibility list for this device is going to be Synology only media. We've seen it with the DS3622XS. We saw it with some of the rack mounted devices in the XS series. Synology have set a precedent for this. Now they've got their Enterprise HET um, 5300 and 5310 hard drives. They've got their SAT 5200 and 5210 uh, SATA SSDs, and they've got their SMV 34 and 3500 and 34, uh, drives there. So they've got that range. Now there is again talk in the with just seeing it popping up online in different places of a standard class Synology hard drive coming to the fold. Again, I've mentioned it in other videos and I mention it again here because I think that will be another choice of drive that will fall into the fold. And I think it's going to be Seagate backed as well. But that aside, there's going to be a lot of users looking at this 8-bay that maybe aren't as in love with just going for their own hard drives. Now again, we don't have any confirmation on hard drive and SSD compatibility on this device. But if we look at those other releases in the XS series in the early stages of 2022, this seems to be a running trend with them and their own media for this solution being enterprise grade and them trying to be the big ecosystem solution. So don't be surprised if this arrives with that same support and compatibility on their official pages being directed just to their own media. It doesn't mean you can't use your own media, but then you are stepping outside of the remit of which they are guaranteeing and promising this device will work within the confines they suggest. But... That is everything we know right now about the DS1823XS+. Plus. It's very early in the morning here on a Sunday. I didn't think I'd be coming in here today, but here I am. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. There's a full article broke down below. It went live yesterday, but I've since updated it with new information that has arrived. So I recommend you check that out. Sorry, this video is quite long, but I really wanted to zoom in on that CPU and its significance within the broader Synology family. There. Let me know what you think in the comments. And if you want to learn more, Again, we're going to be talking about this box a little bit more in the next week, week and a half, um, as we learn more information about it, do some comparisons um, about the rest of the device that we're seeing out there, along with some other information we received as well. On top of that, if you need help choosing the right now solution for yourself, whether you are watching this here in February 2023 or in the future, um, then do take advantage of the free advice section link below over to NAS Compares. It's a big blue button on the right-hand side of every NAS Compares page, or use the free community forum at Ask NAS Compares. Again, it's manned by me, Eddie, who does most of the work on there. I'll be straight with you and other members of the NAS community that will answer your questions when you need them. And finally, if you find these videos helpful, very important, and if you're going to shop at Amazon anyway, again, only if these two things are true, please use the links in the description to take you to Amazon. It will take you to the Amazon store in your region. It won't cost you anything extra and anything. And I really do mean anything you buy results in a kickback coming to here and NAS Compares, where it's just me and Eddie, and that money we get in return allows us to keep doing what we do. So it's an easy, passive way for you to support content without having to do a donation, which I think everybody wins. But again, only do it if you're gonna shop at Amazon and if these videos help you. Apart from that, enjoy the rest of your weekend, everyone. I'm gonna go have a kip. I'll see you later on.